Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to be here, and I really appreciate the, the privilege of, of coming and, and, and talking, and I'd very much uh, <clears throat> look forward uh, to interaction, to discuss uh, the issues that we, that we all face <clears throat> and uh, in a very informal way. Uh, I'm, going to talk, I'm going to talk today uh, regarding the evolution of congestive heart failure. Where are we today and where are we headed? Uh, yeah, I'm here at the, the Cleveland Clinic, Florida, there at the center of that circle, uh, just outside of uh, Fort Lauderdale. And one of the things that uh, <clears throat> we noticed at the Cleveland Clinic is that in that area, <clears throat> the treatment of uh, congestive heart failure was changing. Uh, patients were finding um, <clears throat> limited opportunities for care in the sense that uh, we saw more patients with advanced congestive heart failure. We also saw more patients who left the local area to be taken care of for congestive heart failure. So we recognized this opportunity and decided uh, that we were going to take steps to address it by um, <clears throat> becoming more aggressive and building our program for congestive heart failure. Uh, before three years ago, we had no transplantation program at the Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and we decided to make uh, the major investment in assembling uh, a transplant team, a global multi-organ uh, solid transplant team, including uh, kidneys, liver, uh, hearts, and uh, lungs will be added uh, shortly. <clears throat> One of the reasons for, for this need was this demographic trend. In the U.S., the population of 65 and older is increasing. This process started with the baby boomers and continues today, now that those baby boomers are becoming uh, retirement age. And this trend is not going to stop. Not only uh, was uh, this huge surge of births right after World War II responsible for this trend, but also uh, increasing longevity has increased this elderly population. One consequence of this increase in age is an increased prevalence of heart failure, because heart failure increases in prevalence with age. Now, that first occurs uh, with men starting approximately age 55, then women catch up, and the incidence increases uh, with age. Now, heart failure is becoming an increasing problem. It's becoming more common as the North uh, American population ages, and we made this uh, slide in uh, 2003 where we projected what's going to happen. And, and frankly, this trend has been pretty much on the money. If we project further, we see that this trend is not going to stop, uh, not any time within any of our lifetimes. Now, in treating heart failure, we traditionally have treated heart failure. It is in stages when the heart muscle is already weakened. And this, as a surgeon, is what I typically will take care of. Patients that are in stage heart failure who are failing medical therapy and have no options using conventional therapy or medicine to get better. So the patients are referred to me for consideration for heart transplantation or ventricular assist devices, options that we'll talk about uh, later. But increasingly, we're trying to address heart failure between these two stages, between the normal heart and the, the irreversibly damaged heart. We try to identify those patients who are starting on this pathway towards a weakening heart. And we also try to identify those patients who have a normal heart but are at risk for developing congestive heart failure. Now, the medical therapy for in, uh, congestive heart failure has progressed as well. Uh, and the, the essential paradigm for, for medical therapy begins with ACE inhibition and ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers. Then the addition of, of vasodilators, consideration for alpha blockade, uh, diuretics, digoxin, and, and beta blockers to attend to uh, the cardiac, renal, and the peripheral arterial uh, contributions to congestive heart failure. And we have to remember that congestive heart failure is not just a muscular disease. It doesn't just affect the muscle fibers and their function, but it also, uh, as the heart dilates, affects the electrical system and increases the synchrony between the right side of the heart 
and the left side of the heart, and due to septal motion inefficiency, uh, worsens the congestive heart failure. So, in those appropriate patients, one of the important therapies for congestive heart failure is resynchronization therapy, where we resynchronize the right ventricle uh, and the left ventricle by using the coronary sinus lead. <clears throat> so this is a paradigm for medical therapy for congestive heart failure, where those patients using this uh, ACC classification for congestive heart failure, who in stage A, they're high risk, but have no symptoms, no structural changes in the heart, we begin treating these patients early with risk factor reduction, controlling hypertension, controlling diabetes, uh, treating dyslipidemias, uh, increasing activity, and controlling weight, avoiding smoking. <clears throat> Patient family education, we treat these disease processes. Uh, for those patients who develop some structural heart disease, even if they have no symptoms, they're not aware of a congestive heart failure. If we can identify those patients early enough through screening, we can treat them with ACE inhib inhibition, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, beta blockers, uh, <clears throat> and then we intensify the therapy, add sodium restriction, diuretics, resynchronization therapy if necessary, uh, <clears throat> implanted uh, cardiac defibrillators if the uh, ejection fraction is low, typically less than 30 percent, uh, add aldosterone inhibitors, uh, digoxin, and then finally, um, consideration for inotrope to treat congestive heart failure exacerbations, and we, for patients that are in end stage or not responding to any of these therapies and, and are in stage D, uh, we'll sometimes even consider ambulatory inotropes with intravenous inotropes such as merorinone. <coughs> now, Looking at the treatment options for the end-stage heart failure patients, these patients that are in stage D, the patients that I will typically take care of, medical management, even intensive medical management, is limited by poor outcomes. Con innovative, con innovative conventional surgery, if we can identify patients before they're truly in stage, uh, has an increasingly important role. The most common operation that I perform for congestive heart failure is still coronary revascularization. It's typically multivessel revascularization, patients with other systemic illnesses, diabetes, a renal failure, hypertension, and often is reoperative operations where they've had previous grafts and we're redoing grafts uh, to multiple vessels. That's still the most common uh, surgical therapy for congestive heart failure today. Increasingly, we're treating patients with advanced uh, valvular disease. In this case, the patient had aortic stenosis and the secondary ascending aortic aneurysm with congestive heart failure with ejection fractions typically less than 30 percent. So this is a relatively large operation for those patients, but with techniques that we can use today and with appropriate backup, uh, we're increasingly taking care of these sicker patients, treating their congestive heart failure with an operation that even is uh, latest, the 1990s, that the patients would have uh, not been offered this operation, have been considered uh, contraindicated, frankly. Uh, of course, we also have the uh, therapeutic option of uh, TAVR with a catheter-based valve replacement where we don't have to take some of the risk of surgery or use the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass machine where the valve is, uh, first undergoes balloon valvuloplasty and then the valve is delivered, the, the replacement valve is delivered on a balloon and a stent, and it, the, stent, the balloon is inflated, leaving the stented valve in, in place without needing surgery. Mitral valve disease, very common cause of reversible congestive heart failure, and this valve um, these days are typically repaired if it's a myxomatous degenerative valve, rheumatic valves, in, in my practice, we would typically uh, replace. Uh, but for those patients who are appropriate repair candidates, approximately 95% of these valves can be adequately repaired and not require replacement as a treatment for congestive heart failure. And we still do some structural remodeling for appropriate patients, where a patient who has an MI with an akinetic segment of the heart, 
making the entire global heart function inefficient, we can exclude these weakened areas so that only viable muscle is in contact with the bloodstream. This was an operation we did uh, with some regularity 20 years ago, but with the STITCH trial we're doing less, but selected patients are still appropriate. Now, cardiac transplantation is the most effective therapy for patients who have end-stage heart failure that's not amenable to medical therapy or conventional uh, surgical approaches. But cardiac transplantation is numerically limited by the donor shortage. So typically these patients have, have been treated with risk factor reduction, accelerated medical therapy, cardiac resynchronization, innovative conventional therapy, and failing that becomes stage D with refractory symptoms requiring special intervention. And these patients typically, despite intensive medical therapy, are in and out of the hospital, multiple readmissions for congestive heart failure exacerbations. And those patients are typically referred for consideration for transplantation or ventricular assist device implant, uh, implantation. Now, if we use the New York Heart Association class, these patients are in uh, late cla uh, class three or class four. And if we look at the number of hospitalizations, this is a logarithmic scale for these patients, the number of hospitalizations increasing, increases rapidly. For patients in, in class four, typically uh, 10 or more hospitalizations a year. That's basically once a month in and out of the hospital. And concomitantly, survival goes down. As hospitalizations increase, survival decreases markedly. So patients that require repeated readmissions for congestive heart failure for multiple tune-ups, um, that's a warning sign for intervention because these patients have very high mortality. Well, how high is the mortality? Remember, these are patients with advanced congestive heart failure that are under optimal medical therapy and are still failing, still requiring admissions to the hospital through the emergency room. Um, and for these patients, their mortality at one year is very high, higher than AIDS, leukemia, even higher than lung cancer and approaching the mortality rate of pancreatic cancer. So in stage heart failure with optimal medical management, but still the patient is straddled with severe heart failure. Those patients have a mortality rate at one year between 70 and 80 percent. Now, if we look at the numbers in the U.S. and most countries in the Western Hemisphere have these same issues. We have approximately 5 million total cases at any one time, 400,000 new diagnoses uh, per year. And out of these 5 million uh, cases, approximately 370,000 are either class three or class four congestive heart failure. Now transplantation is the gold standard therapy, very effective. However, from an epidemiologic standpoint, we're only able to treat the tip of the iceberg, even when we do 2,000 transplants per year. Uh, for the last few years, we've approached 2,500 transplants, but still, uh, while this is very effective therapy, it's, it's limited in its availability to most patients. Now, if we look at survival, this is uh, an old slide, but I, I keep it as a baseline slide. Uh, looking at patients from the beginning of the modern era in heart transplantation, 1982 uh, to 2000, where we can follow up these patients for a long period of time. For the patients that survived the operation, survived the transplant, half of the patients are still alive at nearly 12 years. Patients that we transplant today we expect that this half-life will approach 15 years. Now, not only do the patients have a survival advantage, but from a functional standpoint, remembering these are patients in, in class four congestive heart failure, uh, before transplant, after transplant, the great majority of patients have no activity limitations of any kind at one year, three years, and five years. So this improvement, this functional improvement is sustainable. Most of the rest of the patients will require some assistance, and oftentimes that's related to other uh, conditions. A very small number of patients are still limited severely after heart transplant, less than 1%. And very importantly, especially to payers and government decision makers, uh, 
remembering that many of the patients that undergo heart transplantation are approaching an age where they're thinking about retirement. Uh, over time, almost 40% of patients will go back to working either full-time or part-time, considering that most of the patients, are, or, or half the patients are retirement age. That's a, a very good number. If we look at survival by era, beginning at the earliest era, uh, 1982, up to 2001, where we have uh, uh, more than 10 years data, uh, survival is increasing by era. And it's increasing primarily because we're getting better at doing heart transplantation, uh, better from a technical standpoint, from a management standpoint, and also from a decision-making selection standpoint on who we do transplants on and when we do them. Now, this is largely a, a pre-VAD era, and the survival increases even more when we consider the, the VAD era. Now, so well, why not offer heart transplantation for everyone? Well, there are a number of reasons. Number one is we just don't have enough donors to treat everyone. But if we look at patients stratified by age, we can see that survival at different age groups from 18 to 69 is about the same all along. There's one group that stands out, those patients older than age 70. Uh, their survival is about the same as other groups for about five years. And then survival markedly falls off at that time. So as a consequence, many uh, heart transplant programs have an age cut off, uh, commonly 70 years of age. If we look at age distribution of, of cardiac uh, uh, transplant recipients, we see that we're doing a few more patients uh, over age 65, but uh, primarily those patients in the uh, high incidence of heart failure years, but the incidence of heart failure continues high after age 65, after age 70, we make a conscious decision that we don't offer heart transplant to those patients uh, because of those age limitations. Now, this is a, a bit of a complex slide, uh, but what it shows is the effect of center volume on mortality for heart transplantation. So across all age ranges, low volume centers have higher mortality than high volume centers. And this is one argument uh, regarding concentrating the expertise for cardiac transplantation uh, in centers that do a fair number of, of the, the transplants. It's difficult to do transplants in every hospital. The, the expertise is, is difficult to assemble and it's difficult for that expertise to gain the experience necessary to get good, good outcomes. Now, if we look on the financial side of, <clears throat> of congestive heart failure, we see that from a diagnos diagnosis-related group standpoint, this is a, a diagnosis initiated at time of admission. <clears throat> congestive heart failure is the highest volume admitting diagnosis, <clears throat> more diagnosis than any other diagnosis. And in terms of cost, the cost of congestive heart failure treatment, even as, as far back as 1991, is more than the cost of treating all cancers combined, more than the cost of treating all heart attacks combined. As a matter of fact, more than the cost of treating both of these groups together. <clears throat> so it's a tremendous burden on the healthcare system from a financial standpoint. So it's absolutely important that we get this under control. Now, because of the tremendous cost of treating heart failure with medical therapy, we're allowed to consider treating heart failure with other therapies that are very expensive in their initial outlays, but very um, effective, and therefore the overall cost goes down. And we consider some of these intensive therapies like cardiac transplantation, average cost is a difficult number to get at, over 200,000, similar uh, cost for a left ventricular assist device implantation, similar cost to a liver transplant. So these are very expensive therapies to utilize, but remember that medical therapy for these patients who are coming in and out of the hospital once per month is very expensive. And with a medical therapy approach for end-stage heart failure, it's not only ineffective, it's expensive, and half of the cost, half of the lifetime cost of treating that patient occurs in the last 30 days of life. 
So that's the difference between the expenditures for heart transplantation and expenditures for medical therapy. With heart transplantation, we get longevity, we get functional advantage, and uh, the patient lives uh, a long time. Immunosuppression post-cardiac transplantation, uh, one of the issues that we have to consider after heart transplantation is monitoring for allograft rejection. I mention this because um, we typically will require a patient to stay close to our center after heart transplantation because rejection usually has no symptoms, and the rejection is found by surveillance biopsies. And there are some signs that we can sometimes see, but usually we get some nonspecific uh, symptoms, if anything. The patient just doesn't feel as good today as they, they, they felt yesterday, but most patients have no idea that they're having a rejection episode. Rejection uh, is diagnosed by a, an endomyocardial biopsy done through an uh, internal jugular approach with a small biotome uh, that gets an endomyocardial biopsy of the right ventricle. And we do this on a schedule. Now, well, why can't we just do more heart transplants and, and relieve this, uh, this epidemic of, of advanced congestive heart failure? Well, we had this idea once we had the development of cyclosporin in 1982 and we could do more transplants with, with effectiveness. And so the, there was a logarithmic increase in the number of heart transplants. And that, that peaked about 1989 and 1990. And since that time, the number of heart transplants uh, has either fallen down slightly or stayed about the same, depending upon where you're at. In the U.S., um, it stayed about the same and it hasn't grown appreciably. So again, we're, we're treating the tip of the iceberg of these most severe uh, congestive heart failure patients. So when we look in our referral area, we're, we're fortunate in that people in, 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 in our location uh, are very well educated about uh, organ donation and very generous. And so we're in one of the organ-rich parts of the world, really. So we have access to, to organs, but even in our area, we don't have enough organs to treat all the patients who are in need. So the patients can be listed and not transplanted. And before we started our program, uh, the number of transplants was so small uh, that organs were leaving the area, they were sent elsewhere because even though there were patients in need in our area, there were not programs that were willing to take care of these patients and effectively taking care of them. So this is one of the issues that we addressed, and, and this, this problem has, has resolved. We're able to increase locally the number of transplants and availability of transplantation in the area. However, <clears throat> the number of patients needing transplant is overwhelming, so some of the times the patients have to wait. When they wait, there are consequences, and one of the consequences is that the congestive heart failure uh, progresses. Patients are in and out of the hospital. They're facing this high mortality related to multiple hospitalizations. And for patients that decompensate while waiting for heart transplantation, we have the concept of bridge to transplantation. And we use a number of different uh, devices for bridge uh, for transplantation. And again, the goal here is to effectively treat the patient. The, these operations that we use are very uh, expensive devices, expensive therapy. Uh, and the cost is all incurred upon the day of operation. We get the patients better, they're in the ICU, then they go to the floor, the cost lessens. And then, very importantly, today, at the period of time that in our hospital averages uh, about 12 days, we can get the patient home and the costs settle down. And that's important because the, the payers and the, the health uh, system administrators uh, want to see quality and they want to see cost containment. This is one of the devices we use as a bridge to transplant. This is a HeartMate 2 left ventricular uh, assist device. This is a, a valveless electrical system. Uh, this has a, a, a rotor inside. It's connected to the left ventricle, pumps blood through the rotor, and then to the aorta. Uh, there's a drive line that's beneath the skin that exits the skin here. It's connected to the um, electrical components of the system. The patients uh, can be ambulatory with such a system. Uh, when they're ambulatory, they have a controller and two batteries to power the system with the drive line connected, and they have a, a belt or a vest to, to con contain the components. Uh, these devices are like uh, most uh, 
engineer devices becoming um, more optimized, smaller, more powerful, more reliable, um, and um, easier to implant. This, uh, this was a, a, a hardware device, again, smaller, and this is a, a, uh, an MHART, even smaller. This device is still in investigational stages. <clears throat> if we look at survival for patients with bridge to transplant, we can see, again, there's a trend to better survival over time. This is survival in our initial um, experience, and over the eras, the survival has gotten better, such that over 85% of patients uh, in the uh, HVAD study uh, were successfully uh, bridged out to one year with the device. If the other indication for use of these devices are patients who are not candidates for transplant but uh, deteriorating on medical therapy. And we've developed a concept of destination therapy or permanent implantation. These patients are a little different. Sometimes the patients are, are sick or they have other disease processes that don't allow um, a transplantation, such as the patient who had colon cancer and had resection, but it's early on in their uh, post-resection uh, uh, recovery. In this case, we use the same devices, but as a permanent implant. And if we compare these devices to optimal medical therapy, we see optimal medical therapy in these patients has very poor survival. Like I said, about approximately 80, 70 to 80% mortality in one year's time with the best medical therapy. With device therapy in the early phases, that's better than medical therapy. And by era, the survival for permanent implanted uh, patients with these devices has improved uh, with time. This is a patient uh, in the ICU at Cleveland Clinic after implantation of one of these devices. And this is an older model device with quite a large uh, uh, electrical component that he's connected to. But this is after four days uh, after device implantation, the patient's sitting there uh, reading a newspaper in the ICU on nasal cannula oxygen uh, uh, doing quite well. Uh, what this slide doesn't show you is that uh, on this device, the patient is actually in ventricular tachycardia. He doesn't even know it. Uh, the patient, these, it just uh, shows how uh, effective these devices are, even when the heart is in an effect, ineffective rhythm and has no contribution, very little contribution to the patient's cardiac output. The patient's still doing well and doesn't know he's in ventricular uh, tachycardia. I've had some patients come in from home with ventricular tachycardia. Again, they had no idea that they, they had this tachyarrhythmia. But ultimately, the goal is to get the patient home so they can do what's important to them, spend time with the family, uh, and recover and get back uh, to a normal life, uh, doing the activities that, that, that they want to do. And this is for patients that have uh, permanent implants. Uh, this is a group of patients that I transplanted over the years, and this is an older picture. Uh, and uh, this shows uh, just a, a, a selected group of these patients who had these devices put in as a permanent implant. Uh, some of the patients had the device uh, put in because they, had, uh, uh, they were advanced age and were not candidates for transplant on that basis. Uh, others because they were still recovering from cancer. Uh, and uh, this particular patient uh, had, a, had a colon cancer, resected, but he was only one year from colon cancer therapy and had uh, chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. We put a device in. He uh, <coughs> was shown to be cancer-free after five years and ultimately got heart transplantation. And this fellow is a fellow that I put a device in uh, heart made two now um, ten and a half years ago, and as far as I know, this is the oldest surviving uh, patient with this device in who's only had uh, one operation to put the device in. <clears throat> now, as we developed our program at Cleveland Clinic, uh, we, we developed a, a multi-pronged uh, uh, therapeutic uh, program to treat these patients in end-stage um, uh, organ failure. And we developed uh, a program uh, with transplantation for kidney, for liver, and for heart. And beginning here in 2013, when we started these programs, we've had rapid growth. And we've done uh, almost 350 uh, total transplants to date. Uh, and I'm very proud of the efforts of our team uh, to do so. But this is an effort at treating patients in, in end stage. <clears throat> now, as I, I came to this conference, I had the idea uh, being here just north of Miami and flying out of the Miami airport, that 
you know, the Caymans were going to be a long way away, and then we'd come down, and we'd go either to the east or we'd go to the west and come around here, and it'd take, you know, two hours or so. And I was pleasantly surprised to find out we just uh, uh, took a very direct route, and the flight time was, was 40 minutes. And I mention that because we started out with a small circle around our, our hospital, uh, incorporating the patients that we felt needed our, our services and, and we were going to take care of. But very quickly, that circle increased in size, and increased in size, and increased in size. And I, I, th I think that uh, <clears throat> that was necessary because we shouldn't be limited by you know, archaic political boundaries on what patients we can take care of. And certainly patients shouldn't be limited by those same boundaries on, on their access to care. So we began by treating patients uh, from Puerto Rico with end-stage heart failure and found that we could do so very effectively and offer them therapy that they otherwise uh, did not have access to in, in adequate uh, numbers. Uh, so since that time, in terms of applying our multi-organ uh, uh, transplant approach uh, to really what are quite local um, patients. We've uh, done transplants of one sort or another on patients from every country uh, on this chart. Now going back to our treatment options for congestive heart failure and end-stage heart failure, you know, medical management is limited by poor outcomes. Cardiac transplantation is the most effective therapy, but it's numerically limited by the donor shortage, and that's going to continue. Innovative conventional therapy, we're very aggressive at applying this, uh, and we can apply it aggressively because we have the backup of mechanical circulatory support devices. And some patients we take directly to left ventricular assist device implantation. Other patients we would do a bypass surgery or a valve surgery or a combination of, of, of conventional approaches with ventricular assist devices as a backup. And we'll commonly use that for patients that have very low ejection fractions where we think we can recover heart function. Unfortunately, uh, only about 2% of the time do we ever have to activate the backup. Most of the patients, uh, the backup is, is kept in reserve. And of course, at Cleveland Clinic, we're also very active in utilization of the total artificial heart. So this is where I will typically get referred patients, but that's not where we need to be. We need to identify these patients at an earlier point where we can treat them here. And I think the ultimate goal of our strategy for taking care of these patients, these patients with heart failure, and I say this as a surgeon, but the goal from a medical standpoint, from a policy standpoint, should be to put the surgeons out of business. It should make it so that the patients don't ever have to progress to stage D and require our services. And, and as the chairman of our, of our Department of Transplantation, if we can get to the point where we don't need transplantation very often, then I'll consider that I've done my job. So in conclusion, this congestive heart failure incidence is increasing, is epidemic, is epidemic in the U.S., is ep epidemic in, in the Caribbean and in Central America. Uh, the end-stage congestive heart failure has high mortality and tremendous expense to the patients, to their families, to the healthcare system, and to governments. Cardiac transplantation is the gold standard treatment today, followed by ventricular assist device implantation for patients with the most severe form of congestive heart failure. Those above therapies, however, they have limitations due to availability, due to complexity, and cost. And the greatest promise is the early diagnosis and treatment involving cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, and I would say primary care and family doctors as well, to prevent the development and progression of heart failure by treating the underlying causes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. We have time for some questions and answers. If somebody would like to ask a question. How many patients are you implanting the LVADs in? Well, historically, <clears throat> I've done about the same number of LVAD implants per year as heart transplants. Um, so for the last 15 years, that's typically been 
uh, more than 50 of each uh, per year. <clears throat> uh, starting this new program at Cleveland Clinic Florida, <clears throat> because we have uh, heart transplant donor availability, we're doing much more heart transplantation than LVADs. Uh, and we've tried to be aggressive in trying to offer uh, heart transplantation to older patients, to patients that may not be considered at other, other centers. Ultimately, though, we will outrun our donor supply and increase the number of LVADs as the waiting times increase. Right now, our waiting times are very short for heart transplantation, and so that decreases the need uh, for LVADs. We are doing a, a fair number of LVADs for destination therapy for patients that uh, are not candidates for heart transplant uh, immediately. Now, around the country, it's a little bit different picture. There are many parts of the country where donor availability is very, very poor. There are some centers, even historically important centers, that aren't accepting any new patients for cardiac transplantation. And they aren't because they know that those patients will be listed but will have no chance to get a heart because they just don't have the donors for them and they don't have the donors to transplant the patients that are already listed. Consequently, starting about three years ago in the country, the number of left ventricular assist devices implanted uh, surpassed the number of heart transplants. And that increase in LVADs versus heart transplant continues. And I expect that's going to continue uh, forever. The LVADs, of course, have the advantage that they're made in a factory. So availability is not an issue. The cost is high. And it requires a lot of expertise to, to, to do the operation and take care of the patients. But still, the availability of the LVAD itself is not a problem. So I think over time, uh, LVAD use will continue to increase. Now, the goal, the, 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 the goal of LVAD therapy is to make LVADs as durable and effective as heart transplant. Once that happens, if it happens, then LVADs may become the first choice for patients with advanced heart uh, failure, and heart transplant may become a second choice. What's, what's uh, the longest survival for uh, uh, LVAD well, with, the well, new, with the new devices? Well, this is the patient I showed you is uh, 10 and a half years out, and I think he's the longest surviving uh, patient in the world today uh, uh, with an LVAD. He certainly is the longest surviving patient that's had only one operation. Uh, some patients uh, have LVAD implants and then will have some issue requiring change of the LVAD, such as failure of the e electronics, a very rare event, damage to the device, or thrombosis of the device. The, all these devices require full systemic anticoagulation. And the balance of anticoagulation need versus risk of bleeding can become difficult. And there are, there are situations where, for instance, the patients um, may have GI bleeding, especially in the foregut, uh, requiring interruption of their anticoagulation to control, diagnose, and treat the GI bleeding. And uh, that can increase the risk of having thrombosis of the device. Even patients that have adequate therapy for anticoagulation can have thrombosis of the device and require emergent exchange of the device. So that's one of the risks uh, of this de device therapy. In our, in our experience, though, uh, we've been uh, very fortunate and that our thrombosis uh, risk has been very low, and even our GI bleeding risk has been uh, uh, pretty low as well. Um, I just wanted to ask about the organ donation um, laws in, in the US, because I know in the UK and Wales recently they've changed the law so that it is assumed that you are um, agreeable to a donation <coughs> unless you opt out. And of course this would dramatically increase the number of organs available. So I don't know if any of the states in the US do that or if there are any plans for that to happen. Okay, well that's a very good question. Um, I think uh, Spain has sort of led the way for a presumed donation, and, and consequently, they have one of the, the, the highest uh, uh, donation rates in, in the world. Um, in, in the U.S., um, the donation process is really two-pronged. Uh, the person makes a decision as to whether they're going to uh, be an organ donor, and that typically is 
is made and documented at the time that they um, apply for a driver's license. Uh, and that, so they make that decision, and there's a registry. If they agree to be an organ donor, then there's a registry uh, that's built up uh, in every state where they're listed as an organ donor. And if that decision has been made uh, in that uh, time period, then if, they're, um, <clears throat> if they uh, suffer some, some occurrence, uh, leading to brain death, then they will be an organ donor, or at least considered uh, an organ donor, uh, barring any medical exclusions. If they have not made that decision and the patient is brain dead, then their next of kin or their, their health care representative uh, will make that decision. But we don't have uh, presumed consent um, at this point in time. I'm not aware of any state that does. It's been discussed. Um, on a number of different levels, but hasn't come to fruition. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheffield.